In our last installment, we covered the Chainery 2 case, in which the court noted the retroactive effect of common law decision-making. Retroactivity was on the NLRB's mind in its Excelsior Underwear case. The NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, tries to assure laboratory conditions in elections by which employees decide whether or not to unionize, and if so, which union to affiliate with as their bargaining representative. Although the board has rulemaking power, it uses it rarely. Instead, the board develops policy on a case-by-case basis. Informal ULP, or Unfair Labor Practice Adjudications, and certifications of contested elections. The statute only says that no one should restrain or coerce employees in the course of these elections and that they should be fair. Over the years, the board had required employers to disclose a list of employees during the campaign period prior to an election. It had not, however, required employers to disclose employee addresses on the list. Not having access to a list of employee ad- addresses put the union at a disadvantage. In Excelsior Underwear, the employer sent the employees an eight-page letter warning of dire consequences of unionizing. To rebut, the union requested a list of employee names with addresses, which employers are legally required to maintain for tax and other purposes anyway. But the employer, Excelsior Underwear, refused. The union lost the election. The union challenged the result. In its published opinion, the NLRB noted that its precedents applying the statutory standard did not require employers to disclose addresses. Like a common law court, the board viewed this body of precedent as presumptively binding but the court did not regard its precedents as conclusive for all time, and it announced that no later than seven days from the date of its order, it would require employers to furnish a list of addresses with names. This was not preliminary to noticing a proposed rulemaking in the Federal Register as required by APA Section 553. The board did not undertake notice and comment rulemaking. The board announced what we can call the Excelsior requirement in the opinion it issued in a case involving only this election disputed by one union and one employer. Applying the requirement to Excelsior underwear would mean ordering a new election. To avoid giving retroactive effect to the new requirement, the board did not apply it in the case before it. The NLRB denied the union's challenge. The validity of the Excelsior requirement was called into question in the subsequent Wyman-Gordon case. In Wyman-Gordon, the board ordered the employer to furnish a list of employee names and addresses to the unions seeking certification. The employer refused, the election went on anyway, and the unions lost. The board set aside the result and went to court to enforce a subpoena against the employer to produce what we can call the Excelsior List. The district court ordered Wyman Gordon to comply, but the First Circuit Court of Appeals reversed on the ground that the board was seeking enforcement of a procedurally defective rule, the Excelsior requirement. The U.S. Supreme Court granted certiorari to settle a split between the federal circuits about the validity of the Excelsior requirement. There was no majority opinion in Wyman Gordon, but a majority did agree that the Excelsior requirement, or Excelsior rule, was invalid. The board had not followed APA Section 553 notice and comment procedures and it was not free to circumvent those procedures by announcing rules in the course of adjudicating. This would lead one to expect the court to set aside the order and to reinstate the result of the election Wyman Gordon won. But the court upheld the board 
on the ground that its ordering the list was a valid exercise of its adjudicatory power to interpret and apply the statutory standard in an adjudication. In an opinion for the plurality, Justice Fortas tried to explain. Agency adjudications may serve as precedents, but this is far from saying that commands, decisions, or policies announced in adjudication are rules in the sense that they must, without more, be obeyed by the affected public, or for that matter, go through notice and comment rulemaking. The board's precedents bind only the parties. They do not by themselves impose duties on non-parties. Of course, strictly speaking, the Excelsior requirement was not based in precedent. It was dictum because it was not necessary to the decision in Excelsior underwear. The decision in Excelsior underwear was that the election result was valid despite the fact that the employer had not disclosed the list of employee addresses. So, does Wyman Gordon have to face a do-over? It does. Absent this new election order by the board, the respondent was under no compulsion to furnish the list because no statute and no validly adopted rule required it to do so. The court majority agrees that at least once the board has ordered the, the, had ordered the employee list, Wyman Gordon then had a duty to produce it. Justice Harlan's spirited dissent objects to the way the board played fast and loose with the APA, but it seems that his objection would not have arisen had the board, in Excelsior underwear, simply ordered a new election. By trying to avoid the harshness of retroactive effect in Excelsior underwear, the board unnecessarily created the suspicion that it was trying to rule-make without following notice and comment procedures. Ironically, none of the opinions in Wyman Gordon worries about the retroactive effect of ordering the employer to face another election. Not too surprising, since the employer had already been put on notice by the Excelsior Underwear decision that in future elections the address list would have to be disclosed. The most articulate judicial discussion of the retroactivity problem had already been offered three years earlier by Judge Henry Friendly in the Second Circuit in his opinion in NLRB v. Majestic Weaving. In that case, the Textile Workers Union claimed that conditional negotiations entered into by Majestic and the Teamsters prematurely favored the Teamsters in a contest to decide which union would be the employee's representative. In addressing the general problem, he wrote, The problem of retroactive application has a somewhat different aspect in cases not of first, but of second impression, where an agency alters an established rule defining permissible conduct which has been generally recognized and relied on throughout the industry that it regulates. He is addressing the possible unfairness of upsetting the expectations of parties who have relied on prior direction from an agency that, in an adjudication, goes against its own precedents. A decision branding as unfair conduct stamped fair at the time a party acted raises judicial hackles. We will come back to these hackles in a moment. Judge Friendly is making comparisons. Raises judicial hackles considerably more than a determination that merely brings within the agency's jurisdiction an employer previously left without, or shortens the period in which a collective bargaining agreement may bar a new election, or impose, imposes a more severe remedy for conduct already prohibited. Hackles are the hairs on a wolf's neck, which it makes stand up to make itself look even scarier. Yes, even judges have hackles. And the hackles bristle still more when a financial penalty is assessed for action that might well have been avoided if the agency's changed disposition had been earlier made known or might even have been taken in express reliance on the standard previously established. Had Judge Friendly sat on the Wyman-Gordon case, I don't think his hackles would have stood up very far. There was no financial penalty assessed. The employer could not reasonably have relied on pre-Excelsior underwear precedents, 
and even without the benefit of that warning, the employer in Wyman Gordon was only being required to supplement information it was already required to disclose. Let's look at a possibly more sympathetic case from the employer's standpoint. In NLRB versus Bell Aerospace, the board changed its interpretation of the statutory term employee. Formerly, the board did not consider managerial personnel to be employees within the meaning of the Wagner Act. This meant that managerial employees had not been eligible to organize and collectively bargain with their employer. Unlike the labor policies in other countries, like Germany, U.S. labor law sets up a strict division between labor and management, whose functions are assumed to be distinct and their interests in opposition. Obviously, it was disturbing to Bell Aerospace to find that their buyers were trying to form a bargaining unit and to affiliate with a union to represent them in negotiations. Buyers had formerly been considered managerial and, as such, not employees entitled to bargain collectively. An aircraft manufacturer would be easier in its mind if it did not have to wonder whether its buyers were tacitly biased in favor of unionized suppliers. On appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, Bell Aerospace raised two issues. Are managers employees? And are Bell's buyers managers? Bell won on the first issue. This is a pre-Chevron case, but in Chevron ease, we would say that Congress had spoken to the precise issues in question and spoken directly contrary to the board's interpretation. But on the second issue, the court remanded to the board to decide whether or not buyers are managers and to make that determination in the same adjudication. Bell was not happy about this, but the court wrote, the possible reliance of industry on the board's past decisions with respect to buyers does not require a different result. This is not a case in which some new liability is sought to be imposed on individuals for past actions which were taken in good faith reliance on board pronouncements, nor are fines or damages involved here. No new liability, no fines, but if the board on remand decides the buyers aren't managers and can organize, then, well, Bell might as well be in Germany. Another aspect of agency reliance on adjudication might be unsettling. This is the matter of target selection in enforcement. Two cases that illuminate this are Moog Industries versus FTC and FTC versus Universal Rundle. Let's look at Universal Rundle. It is a manufacturer of plumbing fixtures, and it has been ordered to cease and desist from giving truckload discounts, which the FTC considered to constitute price discrimination as defined and prohibited by the Robinson-Patman Act. A truckload discount is essentially a volume discount that discriminates in favor of the bigger buyers and against the mom and pops of the hardware world. Of course, you may be wondering when this Robinson-Patman Act was repealed because it sure looks inconsistent with the Lowe's Home Depot duopoly that dominates the world we live in. It was never repealed. It simply is no longer enforced. At the conclusion of a four-year-long cease-and-desist proceeding, Universal Rundle offered proof that it was a little guy in the plumbing fixture business and that the big guys were engaged in the same kind of price discrimination. Since the cease and desist order bound only Universal Rundle, it would spell competitive ruin if the big guys were free even for a little while to offer truckload discounts while Universal Rundle was under an order not to. Universal Rundle moved for a stay pending the institution of industry-wide enforcement. The FTC denied the motion. The Seventh Circuit reversed, but then the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the FTC. Denying the stay would not necessarily be a patent abuse of discretion, the court wrote, even if Universal Rundle was able to show that its larger competitors were continuing to do what it was having to stop doing and that it would suffer substantially without a stay. 
The court added, The FTC does not have unbridled power to institute proceedings which will arbitrarily destroy one of many law violators in an industry. But, it stated, this is not such a case. If this was not such a case, we have to wonder, what would one have to look like? 